May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Fact. God is in control. Agreed? Then why do you worry? Why do you make decisions or not make decisions and just act as if he really isn't in control? Fact. Everything I have is a gift from God, and God wants me to give to him my trusting and first fruit and and, and prioritized, faithful, sacrificial offerings for his work. He throws out numbers like 10%. And he promises that when I do that, he will provide for everything I need. Agreed? Then why don't we? Why are we $35,000 behind budget on our offerings this year so far? Fact. God is the most important relationship for each and every one of us. Agreed? Then why don't we always give him the time that would show that? Looks like we're coming up on another fact, doesn't it? We don't always treat God as our number one, as our master, right? We know the facts. As Christians, we know what we want our priorities to be, even what we say they are, but we also know that we're living in a world that has a set of priorities that are are very different from that. We're living in a world Where normal is a problem. Where normal leads to hell. And God doesn't want that for you. Jesus loves you. And so he doesn't want you to be living according to priorities that take you away from him. You see, this world has a very different master. Ultimately, it's Satan. But the tool that he uses in our society is quite often money. So Jesus' hard truth for you today is this. You cannot serve both God and money. And that's good news because money is a horrible master. But Master God, Master Jesus, well... He tells us to do what is good and for our good. In our text from Ecclesiastes, Solomon gives us a case study in this. You cannot serve both God and money. And and I'm, I'm sure you've heard of Solomon, right? Solomon was an old man at the time that he wrote Ecclesiastes. He, well... You've heard the stories, right? He was the wisest, the richest, the most powerful, the the, the most blessed, the most respected man in the entire world. He had been there, done that for just about anything you you could name on this earth. He had experienced a life of the very best that this world has to offer. And so now as he's getting towards the end of his days, he teaches us what he learned. If you've read Ecclesiastes before, you know the word that he keeps coming back to to describe it all. Meaningless. He says meaningless, meaningless, everything meaningless. So then why do we pursue it so blindly? In today's reading, Solomon shares with us what he's learned about money. And and truth be told, we've learned it too. Right? We, we've seen it. We've experienced it. It doesn't make sense to live the way the world lives. It doesn't make sense to live for money because master money is an awful master. Master money robs you. 
Look at our text. Truth after truth, fact after fact. Just walk through those first couple of verses and, and tell me that you didn't already know this stuff. It's obvious, right? Verse 10. Whoever loves money never has enough. Whoever loves wealth is never satisfied with their income. We get that, right? John D. Rockefeller was once asked, how much money does it take to satisfy a person? And he, so he was the richest man in the world at the time, the world's first billionaire. His answer? Always a little more. You might have a number in your head that, you know, if I just had that, then, then it would be good. But, but Solomon brings us back to the reality. He says, this too is meaningless. Then verse 11, as goods increase, so do those who consume them. And what benefit are they to the owners except to feast their eyes on them? As the notorious B.I.G. once rapped, more money, more problems. The more you have, the more things you have to worry about. The more people you have to take care of, to take care of the things that you have, the, the, the more problems. And, and, and what does a huge pile of stuff do for you? Think about your closet with all the clothes in there. You can only wear one set of clothes at a time. Think, think about the huge pile of money Solomon envisions. What good does it do? You can look at it, he says. You've heard the stories about the, the people who won the mega millions and ended up bankrupt and miserable. What does all that money do? Well, but Solomon's not done. He keeps going. Verse 12, the sleep of a laborer is sweet, whether they eat little or much. But as for the rich, their abundance permits them no sleep. More money, more stress, more things to worry about. Which means no peace, no relaxation, no sleep. The, the rich might have scientifically superior beds. They might be objectively more comfortable. But master money robs you even of sleep. And he keeps going. I have seen a grievous evil under the sun. Wealth hoarded to the harm of its owners, or wealth lost through some misfortune, so that when they have children, there is nothing left for them to inherit. Have you ever show, seen an episode of the TV show Hoarders, where they go into the house and, and, and they, they meet the people, and, and all of those stacks of possessions and stuff blocking the way, getting... What words would you use to describe those people? Is happy on that list? Not from what I've seen. Joy, no. Even with all that stuff. And he says, or what about, what about if you have all of this, you work so hard to get so much, and then one big mistake, or one crash, or one fire, and suddenly you've got nothing. You don't even have something to, to pass on to your kids. You spent all that time working and, and nothing. Master money is an awful master. He robs you and Solomon keeps going, you know, using this picture, you enter the world naked, but, and, and you don't take anything out of it, right? I'm guessing you've never seen a hearse with a U-Haul attached, right? There's no trailers. You, you don't take anything with you. And, and then he says, you add to that, the, the fact that pursuing wealth leads to so many lonely meals. I, I can't help reading verse 17 and thinking of that proverb about the, you know, better is a small portion of vegetables. So that would have been the poor person's food. Better a small portion of vegetables in peace than the fattened calf with hatred. Master money robs you. He's an awful master. And the worst part is he tries to get you to blame God for the problems that our pursuit of money bring. So it is really good news when Jesus gives us this hard truth. You cannot serve both God and money. So, so don't even try. That's where Solomon comes to at the end of the text. After describing in detail how bad a master money is, he says, but I have found what's good. And look at what he says. Verse 18, this is what I have observed to be good. 
that it is appropriate for a person to eat, to drink, and to find satisfaction in their toilsome labor under the sun during the few days of life God has given them, for this is their lot. So in other words, while we are in this world, on this earth, we toil. Whether we're following Master Money or Master God, we toil, right? He said there, there is toilsome labor. But notice the difference in perspective. If, if we look at the purpose of our work as making money, well, our work is always going to be frustrating because it's never going to make enough money because remember, that bar is constantly changing. That, that goal is, is never enough, right? Always a little more, Rockefeller said. So if, if we look at our, the purpose of work as making money, we'll have problems. We'll always be frustrated. Instead, he says, find satisfaction in the work itself. And he says this doesn't just apply if you have some glorious, noble, praiseworthy job. He calls it toilsome labor. So instead of chasing a number that just keeps moving away from you, he says find satisfaction in the work itself. Satisfaction in toilsome labor. Whether your work is teaching a classroom of children or... or collecting garbage, whether it is changing a diaper or leading some important business meeting, whether your labor is dealing with frustrated people or packaging a product day in and day out. Find satisfaction in your lot. And did you catch that? Did you catch how it's possible? Because... It's the lot that God has given you. Really, we're talking about the doctrine of vocation here. God has put you where you are among the people among whom he has put you with the task which he has given you, with the gifts and skills and ability that he has given you for you, for a purpose so that you can find satisfaction in the lot that he has given you. And maybe your lot is, is something that helps all sorts of people and it's really obvious. And maybe you don't always see that. But he says find satisfaction in it. And think about why, because it might not be the, the, the work itself that is helping someone, but the fact that he has given you the work so that you can help the people in your life that God has called you to, to take care of, your, your family, your kids, your, your neighbors, your, your community. When you can appreciate your job as a means to that end, well, there's satisfaction. And then he says, what, what if God gives you wealth too? And we can kind of remove that what if, right? I mean, I could have spent 20 minutes talking about how we are wealthy, right? I mean, you've got an extra set of clothes at home that's more than half of this world's population. So, so we can take out the, the maybe God gave you wealth. He has. And look at what Solomon says about that. He says, moreover, when God gives someone wealth and possessions and the ability to enjoy them, to accept their lot and be happy in their toil, this is a gift from God. It's a gift. That's how God works. That's the kind of master Jesus is. Money is a master that demands work in exchange for a wage. Jesus is a master that freely gives. Think about that difference. And think about why it is that, that we're so often tempted to, to follow master money, to pursue that like it's, like it's all that. Really, it comes down to pride, doesn't it? Because money is a tangible tool that we can use to, to see what I've accomplished and to compare with, with others. So you see how God works exactly the opposite of that? It's all a gift. What God gives is a gift. Even the ability to work and the ability to find satisfaction in that and the ability to provide, it's all a gift. 
So in that way, it's the very same as our salvation. You know, when, when we look at our salvation, at our relationship with God, and, and try to gauge it, try, try to evaluate it based on what we accomplish, well, we're going to be frustrated because we fail. Right? Because you know, we, we said that, that the bar for money is always moving. The bar for salvation isn't moving. God has set it at perfection. The only problem is any of us who have ever sinned know that, that we cannot achieve perfection because we've got that sin on us. So no matter how hard we try, how hard we work, we're never going to get it. So God gave his one and only son. Jesus gave his life. He gave what we could not accomplish, the, the perfection that only he could, could come up with. The perfect price, painted in full for our sins. He gives forgiveness of sins, new life, and salvation, even when we so often misplace our priorities. He gives. In our relationship with God, we only have peace when we realize that we can't do it but he gives freely, graciously. And when we see that, then we can appreciate all the work and all the other things as gifts from him. And we can appreciate our lot. And, and, and to keep us from becoming bored, he says, yeah, you get to do this. You get to live for me now. So it's the same thing with money. We know God has it. We know God's in control. We know that God's the one who has given us all we have, and, and, and he tells us to enjoy it. And that happens when we can appreciate the fact that it is a gift from God. We can appreciate our labor, even our toilsome labor, as his special prize for me individually. He's given me what to do so that I can do it for him. And then we don't fall into the trap that Paul talked about in our second lesson where the love of money is, is, is snaring people who are living for it. Then we can use our money the way Jesus talks about in the gospel lesson for what really matters. And then just because he's so awesome, Master God gives us another bonus. Look at, look at the last verse there when he's talking about people busy finding satisfaction in, in their work. He says, they seldom reflect on the days of their life because God keeps them occupied with gladness of heart. When we're busy serving God and our neighbor through our work and our volunteering and all the other things that he gives us to do, well, we're focusing on that. And we don't have time to, to, to worry too much about life or, or the politics or the conspiracy theories or, or whatever else people get so stressed out over. We've got more important things to focus on. And all of them are a gift from God. So let's see everything, even our money, like that. Whatever I have and whatever I do is a gift from God for my good. So we can order our lives uh, according to his priorities now. And we can use the money he gives us for what really matters. May God grant it in Christ. Amen. Now may the peace of God that passes all understanding keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen.